Hey, Cypher here. It's been a long time since I did a video on mistakes that I've done on the channel. I'm always willing to fess up to what I've done wrong, at least I try to be, but it's been two years since the last time I did a video on this. So first of all, yes, I make mistakes. Everybody does. But maybe you can prevent yourself from making such mistakes with today's sponsor. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes covering dozens of creative and entrepreneurial skills. If you want to prevent mistakes, be sure to click on the link below. More on Skillshare after the video. So, one important thing you can always do is go and check to see if I pinned a comment where I will often put errata about the video. Heck, even every once in a while I will just pin the person who points out the mistake. But that's of course assuming that there's only one mistake. <laughs> I don't think any of these are particularly damning, but they do show that this is a creative process, prone to making mistakes that can make it all the way through the steps of production. So I'm just gonna go back a few videos where I know that there are actual mistakes and try to explain them. Sometimes they're not exactly content problems, and sometimes they are direct issues. And as a historian, it's important to be able to fess up to your mistakes. We do not want to support that silly idea that we are somehow omniscient. History is as much an art as it is a science, if such silly divisions are to be upheld at all. And the second to last video I have released recently is Things Movies Cannot Do Accurately. Now this is one of those ones that it's not exactly a mistake that I can pin a comment on, nor is it exactly a real mistake. It's a problem in terms of clarification. So at one point, I call the Spanish regime under Franco fascist. Because they got the fascist leader of Spain to loan out troops. And that's mm, not exactly considered okay. There's a lot of debate on what to call Franco's regime, but I wasn't exactly alluding to that. I was just trying to say he was dictatorial. And I'm pretty sure most people are not willing to argue with that. But then I also juxtapose that to the left and say that the Soviet Union was dictatorial. They got another dictatorial regime to loan out soldiers, this time the Soviets. Once again, I'm not exactly incorrect there, but it is definitely an oversimplification. Here I am simplifying for the sake of narrative, so as to flow through to other points. But I could have put a little bit of text in the corner of the screen or something like that. Now that being said, it is important to point out there are a lot of people on the internet who are dedicated to saying what is left or right. But I think the juxtaposition of left and right are not only man-made constructs, but are inadequate to engage with the political concepts they are trying to align with. Of course, I don't really know how to put that all into one little footnote. And for a video that is focused on movies, rather than the larger construct of left and right politics, yeah, I don't think that quite matters, but I understand the problem. By the way, while we're talking about putting footnotes or little text blurbs on the videos, it's also common for people to point out things that I put a little text blurb in the video. So oftentimes, even putting that little text blurb doesn't deter people from ignoring what is said in the video. But it would be nice if people would stop saying, Haha, you made a mistake, when I point out the mistake in the video itself. So let's move on to the real conspiracies in US history video. So I made a minor definite mistake where I wrote that Pinochet took office in 1974, but that was actually when he redefined the office. It was a year prior that he took office. Pretty minor, so why include this video? Well, a lot of people are trying to say in the comments that I should have included Operation Northwoods. But here's the thing. In order for something to be a conspiracy, somebody has to conspire with somebody else. So, 
The whole point of that video was to say, here are some very real conspiracies that happened in United States history. And oh, by the way, conspiracy theorists have never figured these things out. It has always been people doing proper investigation because you can't deny the thing you're investigating. That's the whole point of the video. Conspiracy theorists lie. But they will use Operation Northwoods as evidence that the US participates in false flag operations. The only problem with that is it was never an actual operation. It was a proposition. One that never made it any further than a memo. Therefore, it cannot be a conspiracy because one person cannot conspire. One dude saying, hey, here's an idea we could do, and then everybody else going, mm, no. That's not a conspiracy, folks. That's just a dumb idea. Of course, my mistake was not including it in the list. Even though it's not a conspiracy, I did include the Tuskegee experiments, and those weren't a conspiracy either. In fact, I say so in the video. I don't know if I can exactly qualify them as a conspiracy. So I probably should have included Operation Northwoods just to be able to shut up a bunch of conspiracists. But honestly, they aren't going to shut up anyways. Alright, going on to the next one, let's talk about the West Virginia State Rivalries episode. The one thing that I've been getting comments incessantly about is that I mispronounced a name. For any West Virginians here, you can tell me which one of these is the correct pronunciation. Kanawa. 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 Kana. Kana. I've literally received comments saying every single one of those is the correct pronunciation. And as one historian I know likes to say, you've got to learn how to mispronounce correctly. And in this case, I mispronounced incorrectly. Being from Nevada, I know what it's like. Every time I hear somebody say Nevada, my blood begins to boil. Way, and there is a correct way, as our in-house linguist George Lewis found out. Memo to all those political candidates trying to win votes in the silver state. Nevada, not Nevada. Nevada. So I do get it. But then again, I've also had people say that I'm not a historian because I mispronounced something. Which is dumb. If anything, it shows that I'm actually reading. Amazing. Reading. Something apparently historians don't do. I even had one guy who was complaining about that and then tried to make a bunch of other points that were like, Stonewall Jackson wasn't born in West Virginia? Yes, he was born in what would become West Virginia. That's pretty freaking obvious. West Virginia didn't exist until 1863. But for some reason, if I mispronounce something, everything else is in question, and then they're willing to lie in order to make everything else seem wrong. Well, that's not how truth works. You don't get to just deny everything because somebody mispronounced a word. So let's move on to something more substantial, which is the feminism video. I made a couple of pretty bad ones here, actually. So the first thing that was pointed out was that I said the word transgenders as if it's a plural, and apparently I should have used the word transfolk. Now honestly, I just simply didn't know that that was a bad thing. Apparently transgender is only supposed to be an adjective. This is not appeasing the PC police or whatever. There are many, many words that are only meant to be adjectives, and then people using it as a noun just sounds weird. Sometimes it gets accepted. Think the word cringy. Cringe is a verb, but people will say cringy or the cringe as if it's a noun. Even though we do have a word for that, it's called cringe worthy. But this is an example of the internet not knowing its English very well, and so coming up with a new word because it doesn't have a good enough vocabulary, and then that lack of vocabulary ends up getting codified. It is kind of a form of ignorance, but it's a collective ignorance on the part of the whole of society. So I don't really want to play into that, and so yeah, transfolk is a better word. Then there's also my list of women who helped get the suffrage amendment passed. And in there, I list Emma Goldman. Now I can tell you that was an honest mistake. It actually wasn't supposed to get in the script like that at all. 
she was actually fairly radical and kind of against women's suffrage. It's weird. I put a link in the pinned comment explaining that. But yeah, she shouldn't be considered to have supported suffrage. But this is one of those things where production got in the way of accuracy. I was smashing together two separate parts so as to make the whole thing flow. That video got re-edited something like six or seven times. I was working with a sociologist and new ideas kept coming up and it was difficult to, you know, put these things together. So the part where I'm talking about the amendment and its relationship to Woodrow Wilson was actually added after having recorded the list of women who were major feminists during the passage of the 19th Amendment. This is where it becomes a problem when you are repeatedly going back and re-editing things to add stuff. Because that Wilson bit that was in there, I actually didn't have it in the original cut. A patron reminded me, where's the Wilson bashing in this? And I kind of went, oh yeah, whoops. <laughs> so I went and added it before release, and that's how that whole juxtaposition happened. So you can see there are mistakes that slip in simply because of production. Remember, I'm just one dude, so these things will happen. So going on to a different kind of error, the inability to elaborate. Now a lot of the time, I'm having to cut things down to size simply for brevity's sake. And in the 12 Strong review, I really go after critics of the movie. And I think I might have not explained myself well enough. You see, in the video, I say this. The way the press has treated this film is dishonest and frankly abhorrent. Why is it, when a World War II movie comes out and is all cool and action-packed, complete with a happy ending, everyone's fine with it? But oh god, Afghanistan is too scary for their feeble minds to comprehend that a film doesn't need to constantly say, War is bad, meh. They are telling an amazing story, but you want to insert your own politics. But for some reason in there, I'm just assuming that, like, all viewers are supposed to know the difference between Afghanistan and Iraq. But since critics are being that negligent, why should I expect my viewers to be any more knowledgeable? They're getting fed this kind of BS, so it should be my job to fix it. So in the pinned comment, I just explain what I said a little bit further by saying, Critics are using this movie as a punching bag so that they can complain about the current state of the war. They refuse to accept that the war has changed over time, instead saying it has always been one of occupation. This is blatantly false as the movie shows, and they do not want to be disproven. So instead, they complain that the movie doesn't challenge the actual war, which is not the movie's obligation. Its obligation is to the story at hand, and if pandering to anachronistic political sympathies is not within the story's ability to convey, it should never change that story to fit their beliefs. Complaining that a movie does not push their anachronistic agenda is not only false, but abhorrent for it denies the agency of basically everyone involved, from Bush to Bin Laden, especially the people the story is about, as in ODA 595. Essentially, they are lying when they criticize the film in this way. You see, that's a lot to say, and often I don't really know what level of knowledge I should be speaking to. Like, how much should I expect you guys to know beforehand? Like, how much do I have to explain things? This is always kind of a big question because, well, I don't have a lot of time to keep your attention. So I can't explain everything to the nth degree. But I also know that I'm coming from a place that so much of this stuff is not really known to people despite me thinking it's common knowledge. Common knowledge for scholars is very different from common knowledge for the public. Maybe I can make a diatribe on that. But in terms of needing to explain myself further, there's a lot of times like this, so I'm just using this as an illustrative example. Oftentimes, I am responding to comments when I have to elaborate further. It's one of the ways that I get to sense out what should be perceived as common knowledge in the public. Alright, so two more. So let's talk about the Battlefield 5 diatribe. Now I have to first point out, diatribes, just like this one, are unscripted, at least to a degree. Meaning more mistakes will slip through, 
simply because I'm not doing this with a script. They're also meant to be put out rather quickly, so obviously I'm going to make mistakes that way too. So the first mistake is that I say there are tanks in the desert. What? That didn't happen in World War I. Like, what? Well, that's not exactly true. There were actually eight tanks sent to the Second Battle of Gaza. They fared miserably, and that proved the ineffectiveness of tanks in the Middle East, at least for the time. That's one of those problems with superlatives. Even on something like that, somebody's gonna point out like, ah, wait, no, there was this one time. And I kind of love that pedantry because yeah, technically I was incorrect. Also, I got pictures mixed up in terms of the female spies in that. Though, I also think that these mistakes kind of play into the point of the video, which is basically the ridiculousness of the Battlefield series allows for showing women in combat, at least to the level of accuracy that they have thus far aspired to. There are a lot of negative comments on that video, a lot of which show the blatant sexism that I was trying to fight. But leave it to gamers to act as though they are fighting for some noble cause, when in reality they're just trying to push a false image of history in order to keep it an all-boys club. This is the sonorous war cry of a very angry frog. And I think I'm going to end with the Stars on Flags video. Now there are a hilarious amount of comments that simply do not understand the video, even though I make it pretty explicit in the beginning of the video. Stars on flags have a lot of different meanings, but they also are kind of weird in terms of what they mean. In fact, stars on flags don't necessarily mean anything. Like there are people who honestly think that the video is trying to say that all stars on flags mean that they're going to be annexed by the United States. But there are a lot of comments that are also saying, hey, you forgot about this thing that doesn't exactly fit the formula that you're talking about. Probably the biggest omission is the Virginia, Virginia, I don't know how to say that, Virginia Sun. It was an essential symbol of the Macedonian regime back in the 4th century BC, and probably had a huge influence on later star symbology. A lot of these videos where it's kind of like a list of things that are trying to show something, yeah, I'm having to omit things because, well, I can't cover everything, especially in a video that's only 15 and a half minutes. The whole prompt for that video was what the heck the star on the California flag is, because you'll still see plenty of people trying to claim that John C. Fremont was a filibuster. Now, this is actually something that's been argued since 1847, but the star on that flag is not a filibuster star, for sure. It is referencing a previous star flag for California. And that's the point of the video, is showing that there's a historical sequence to the symbolism. Pragmatic semiotics. Screw structuralism, screw post-structuralism, we got pragmatism. A lot of the time these videos are actually trying to kind of sneak in a deeper philosophical point especially these list videos, but I will have to omit things, and sometimes they're pretty big omissions. Like another list video that I did a while ago was the top 10 border walls and their effectiveness. I mean, that was a hack job for sure, and I'm planning on redoing it, but I literally made that episode in a matter of a week and a half with nothing but Wikipedia as references. Once again, I omitted a lot. Because that's the thing about making videos or really any kind of history. Mistakes are sometimes necessary and sometimes unnecessary. It's difficult to tell the difference. So I do make mistakes and I try to acknowledge them if I can. Sometimes they're not exactly something that I can acknowledge in a comment, but other times I will just pin a comment saying, here is my mistake. Just as new editions of history books acknowledge the errors in the previous edition, pinned comments offer that ability, but it does require people actually paying attention. I still get comments on the Pearl Harbor episode complaining that I called a B-25 a B-17. I, I not only put a comment in there, but I made a whole video last time, and yet they're still commenting. So if you are going to point out one of my errors, be sure to check if I haven't already acknowledged it. These kinds of mistakes slip in inevitably. 
and a good historian will acknowledge their mistakes. Of course, a good way to prevent such mistakes is to learn your craft with today's sponsor, Skillshare. I started taking a course on creative nonfiction from a reporter for The New Yorker. Hopefully I'll improve my writing a bit. Can you go into the story with a genuine interest in learning about it? There's all kinds of classes for anything that you might want to build a skill in, all just waiting for you to get a premium membership, unlocking full access. If you click the link below, you'll get a two-month free trial, and it only costs $10 a month after that. So get better at whatever skills you want with Skillshare, linked below.